Good morning. Well, uh, my name is Carmelo Rodriguez, uh, the rector of the University of Almeria. I would like to welcome you to the International Cooperative Alliance 2016 Committee on Cooperative Research Conference hosted and organized by the University of Almeria and the Cathedra Coespa in Horticulture, Cooperative Studies and Sustainable Development in concert with the International Cooperative Alliance Committee on Cooperative Research. Uh, to beginning, I shall give the floor to Professor Simeon Carafalo, Carafalos, Car Carafolas, sorry, <laughs> Carafolas, uh, member of the Committee on Cooperative Research of International Cooperative. Has the floor. Thank you. Dear rector, dear friends, dear colleagues, buenos dia. I would like to welcome all of you at uh, this ICA conference in this historic region of Almeria, crossroad of uh, cultures. And it's really a pleasure to be here in Almeria. Uh, this conference follows uh, the previous conferences uh, in uh, 2015 in uh, Paris and uh, in Natalia in uh, Turkey. Uh, this conference themes are creation, transition and transformation, which, is, which are main themes of uh, economic uh, situation today, especially uh, what was created after crisis. And I think these are not only main points on a theoretical point of view, but on a practical as well. And I think that cooperatives have to give their answer on that. And I hope on this conference, on these three days that will follow, we can find some answers on these issues. But a conference is not only the discussion of uh, some issues, very important issues. It's also the opportunity to meet each other again. This is an annual opportunity we have within ICA conferences. We can rebuild old uh, friendships and create new uh, friendships, but also create collaborations and networkings and I take the opportunity to mention a book that uh, we published uh, within uh, 39 authors on credit unions, and uh, these authors are mainly uh, regular participants of ICA. I hope in these three days we will be richer on this point and will be richer on this friendship as uh, well. At the end of uh, the conference, we shall discuss some issues on uh, publications, but uh, we shall discuss also some changes that uh, have been on the research committee since my term expires after this conference. And, uh, there will be some changes on the research committee on the European uh, level. Before ending, I would uh, have to express my gratitude to the Spanish colleagues, organizers, especially to the University of Almeria who host this conference, and also the sponsors, but uh, many, many thanks and congratulations go to Cynthia, who proposed in Paris to host this conference. I saw she's, she was very much motivated, and I think I was right to give the conference here. Just see the fact that we have about 180 participants coming from 40 countries from all the world, from Europe, of course, from America, from uh, Africa, from Asia. So, bienvenida, 
in Almeria. Enjoy the ICA conference. Enjoy Almeria. Gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next, uh, Dr. Cynthia Llano Cabo, uh, principal organizer of ICA and co director of the Cathedra Corparual, uh, has the floor. Thank you. How does this work? Is this on? Okay. Is this working? Yes, perfect. Well, this is just a pl tremendous pleasure to have you all here. Um, thank you for coming to this little lost corner of the world. I can't believe that so many of you um, decided to come. You put in very interesting papers. And finally, for those of you who I don't know, I've had the chance now to see the faces that match all of the abstracts and the registrations and everything else. Um, as mentioned a little bit before, it's very clear that this area has gone through tremendous change in Almeria. In the 1950s, this was the poorest area of Europe. And thanks to the cooperative businesses, it's now a thriving economy. It provides a tremendous amount of work for people, 35,000 people, 70 cooperatives, 15,000 small family farmers, and all the businesses that grew up around it. So we can truly say that it's a cooperative economy However, one thing I'd like to point out is that doesn't mean that things are always rosy. There's a lot of work to do, there's a lot of competition, and one can never stay still. Hence, the reason that we chose the, the theme of this conference is that it's not only about creation, but it's about all the transition and transformations along the way. And research has a very important role to play in that. And we have a very important role to play in that. We need to support our cooperative sectors, by carrying out good research, objective research, based on fact, not on wishes. And um, I welcome all the papers that we've seen, um, and I think that's the spirit of it, is, is to do good, solid research within the ICA and, and to make that research available to the cooperative sector so that they can continue to be successful and that they can they can change and transform as necessary. Their businesses, they're often focused on what they do. They don't have a chance to spend as much time thinking about the world in many ways out there. I mean, they're concerned with markets, but not so much what's going on in the cooperative world. And that's our role to play. So I won't keep it too long. I'll talk later throughout this conference. You'll hear from me. So I'll let others talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, now, Mr. Luis Miguel Fernandez, manager of uh, COESPAL, has the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are very present and proud for uh, helping uh, Cynthia to bring this event to Spain. We think perhaps it won on the most uh, important Congress celebrated ever in Almeria. Uh, in COSPAL, we are an association uh, of the cooperative in, in Almeria, uh, near 100 cooperatives. Uh, we think this Congress is uh, going to be very uh, worth for our cooperative. Uh, we are talking the ICE 60 University of, um, of the World present in this Congress. Uh, for Almeria and for our food industry, uh, the agro cooperative is one of the more, is one of the main st state of our economy. Um, the social economy is uh, very important for our, for our uh, province, for Almeria. Um, I, I don't want to, to say any more. I, I just uh, want uh, the Congress to, to begin uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so welcome to Almeria, and thank you for coming here. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Uh, I am 
delighted to give the floor to Mrs. Maria del Mar Vázquez Agüero, Deputy Mayor of the City of Almería. Good morning, everyone. Cooperation plays a very important role in our society. Being able to change through strategies and policies the life of many people. In Almería, we have a strong cooperative ties and increasing agricultural cooperative community. With 13,000 small family farmers and around 70 marketing, supply, and services cooperatives, we are sure that at the Congress, we will see new ideas to improve the economy and culture to protect our environment across the globe. It's a pleasure for our city to host this international conference where many people are going to show us how to manage their cooperative creations and handle their transition and transformation through the time. In the name of the city hall and its mayor, I would like to wish you a very productive stay. And if you have a few hours, <clears throat> try to visit our great city, taste our delicious tapas, our know our cinematographic history and please enjoy our hospitality. Welcome to Anne Marie and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, the thing of this conference is, is about understanding, uh, managing cooperative creation, transition and transformation. As a young university funded in uh, 1993, we also understand the various stages of growth uh, and transition. We have lived through this process here alongside our cooperative uh, sector, starting off as a college of the University of Granada to become a university with international reputation in the fields of agriculture. In this context, uh, it is a member of the Agri-Food Campus of International Excellence, a consortium in which you are is joined by the University of Cali, Cordoba, Huelva, and Jaén, together with the Spanish National Research Council and the Agricultural and Fisheries Research and Training Institute of Andalusia. The University of Almería constantly uh, sees the strengthen is tied with, sorry, seeks to strengthen its ties with other economy and social stakeholders. We are dedicated uh, to providing the research and intellectual tools to build a sustainable society, and cooperatives play a significant role, particularly in Almeria. The organization of this conference falls within the general strategy of our university's research and teaching to promote and participate in a serious and full analysis of cooperatives, businesses, and their socio-economic models with the purpose of exchanging knowledge and contributing to the success of our, of our cooperatives as they meet a wide range of challenges. In light of this, we are in complete alignment with the goal of the Committee of Cooperative Research, which is to act as a bridge between academic research and the cooperative board. You have lead a field agenda, agenda of interest speaker and parallel session, and I am sure uh, you will have a very fruitful work session. I expect that the next three days are not only intellectually stimulating, but also enjoyable, and that you have, a, um, that you have time to appreciate the product of our cooperative and the unique landscape in which they are situated. And of course, that you will find some time to explore and enjoy Almeria during these days. So I wish you have a profitable and successful program a pleasant stay, and I hope uh, you will be satisfied, satisfied with both the conference and the province of Almería. Once again, on behalf of the University of Almería, welcome to all of you. Uh, this conference is inaugurated. Thank you very much.
going to change the table and we'll start with our keynote speaker. I'll make a short introduction and, and then we'll start with the keynote. Very busy days. Okay, before I introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Johnston Birchall, I want um, to say that we have very, very full days, and our agenda is um, from early morning to late in the day. So I just want to get straight what we have in front of us in addition to the parallel sessions. Um, we do have young scholar sessions. Yesterday we had a research and writing session with um, Professor Costas Iliopoulos, and this afternoon from six o'clock to eight o'clock we'll also have um, a young scholar session dealing with research center and research careers. And then on the 26th of May in the morning, it's a self-directed young scholars session where they can do a needs analysis. And I apologize for the early hour, but we don't have much room in our schedule. Um, we have the keynote today, and the commentators afterwards will be Professor Carla Bortaga, Professor Dion Poehler, and Dr. Linda Shaw. And after Professor Johnston Birchall makes his presentation, perhaps those people can come up to the table. Okay. Tomorrow, in the morning, we have a plenary session with Professor Hans Groneveld, and then we have three commentators as well, Professor Dante Craconia, Professor Pilar Alguacil, and Professor Michael Cook. And then, on the last day, we have conclusions and a presentation, publication op options. We have a video and presentation by the Quebec 2016 Summit. We have a presentation of the upcoming 2017 Research Conference of ICA Research Committee. And then we'll have a presentation of the first international forum on cooperative law. And then we'll have a presentation of the publication options and the various representation representatives of those journals. Now let me pop back because I forgot something here. Um, 
We also have um, an impromptu suggestion that all the lawyers in the room, you don't have to identify yourself now, but um, on Thursday lunchtime, if they would like to have a meeting in the next room in the Salad Dos and Salad Two, um, and Professor Henry Hagen will be doing something with the lawyers, planning, plotting something, okay? So that's what we've got now, okay? So um, let me introduce our keynote speaker, and then he can get started on the most interesting things. <clears throat> I'll stand up here, I guess. Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, we've had the pleasure of having Professor Johnson Birchall here in Almeria for a few days. So it's been really nice, and I, I think you probably have enjoyed mm -hmm, a yeah. little bit the area. Yeah. 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 Um, he's a professor emeritus at Stirling University in Scotland. He's a social economist who specializes in member-owned businesses. He studied at Oxford, did his PhD at York University. But an interesting fact is that he spent five years as a housing association manager before embarking on his research career. I have a feeling that changed things a bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know you'll talk about that. So he's been researching stakeholder participation in cooperatives, mutuals, public service for quite a long time. He has 10 books. Um, two of the most recent ones are People-Centered Businesses, Cooperatives, Mutuals, and the Idea of Membership, and also Finance in the Age of Austerity, The Power of Customer-Owned Banks. When he wrote People-Centered Businesses, I had the pleasure of reviewing this book for a journal. And I read it on my summer holidays. And it was actually quite enjoyable. It was a good read, but I thought, when I was writing the review, I thought, this, this man is mad. He's absolutely insane. To try to set out and do what he wanted in that book was amazing. And I thought, you know, if we were talking about shareholder-owned companies, no one would have written a book like that. He talked about 10 different theories. He went through, I don't know how many sectors, seven, something like that. 200 years of cooperative history, case studies, everything else. But the point was, it's precisely because it was cooperatives that that kind of book was necessary. Because there are so many gaps, there are so many things to fill in, that this book served that purpose. And um, not a, I, I don't think you're mad. I don't think you're mad. But I do think you're passionate. And I think that comes through in your writing, but it also comes through as a person. Um, not only passionate about cooperative studies and research, but passionate about many other things, like music and traveling and understanding how people are and an empathy. And that really came, they came through. One other tiny little story about the empathy is that we were in the conference hosted by Uriksay in Venice. And I was without my meal ticket. I forgot my breakfast ticket. So I stood there rather foolishly looking around, and they were really demanding that I needed this ticket. And Professor Birchall came up to me, and he said, well, here, take my ticket, take my ticket. And I thought, well, that's just so nice. And you know, that was my first introduction to you in person. So there we go. Um, with, so I have great pleasure in letting you have the, the, the microphone. But first, thank you so much for coming and agreeing to, to be our keynote speaker. Thank you. Real pleasure. OK. Thanks very much. Right. It's really interesting when you, you look at your, the computer and everything's in a different language. <laughs> so you just wait for somebody else to help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think this should work. Okay, can I use the computer instead? Yes. Right, just do that one. Okay, I'll do that. Right, thanks very much. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. 
Cynthia. It's a, it, it is a great honor. Um, I have to say that when I accepted the invitation, I thought, oh, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, I don't tend to get nervous doing this sort of thing because, you know, like everybody else, you know, you, you, you get used to doing it. And then I saw <laughs> who was here. <laughs> and it's everybody. Everybody is here. And now I'm nervous. So uh, <laughs> I hope you give me uh, at least a, um, a few minutes to, uh, to get into it. Um, I want to do three things in a very short space of time. First of all, I thought I would try to provide a short commentary on the theme of the conference, understanding the stages of cooperative creation, transition, and transformation, so that before we go into the kind of uh, uh, routine of very uh, narrow uh, uh, work um, in, the, in the workshops, uh, I want to try to set the scene, and particularly for the, the young researchers, to provide a few basic um, distinctions, which I think uh, might help. Um, secondly, I want to make some suggestions as to how to link the study of governance uh, with these stages in cooperative development. And then provide a very brief summary of my recent research into the governance of large cooperatives. They're at a, a <clears throat> that are at what you might call a late stage in their development. Um, uh, something that I'm still very excited about, even though it's couple of years since I did the research, excited because in fact it's, it's so new and it was so interesting uh, to do it. I'll tell you about a little bit about that later. So first of all, how do we understand the stages of cooperative creation, transition and transformation? Well, uh, cooperatives uh, are not like frogs. Uh, if they have a life cycle, it's not quite the same. They're certainly not like any kind of living organism, because as far as we know, all living organisms uh, are born, live for a certain amount of time, and then die. Cooperatives can be transformed. Cooperatives can merge into other cooperatives, and have done uh, many, many times, so that the assets of the cooperative are still there. So what do we mean uh, by the death of a cooperative? apart from in the obvious case, where a cooperative goes bankrupt and literally goes out of business, and the assets are, are lost forever. What do we mean by um, uh, these, this late stage in the life cycle? Um, I think I'm tempted to use uh, another analogy uh, and to say that inside a big cooperative like the UK Cooperative Group, which I'm going to say a little bit about later, um, you've got the DNA of several hundred other cooperatives which merged, sometimes from weakness, sometimes from strength, into what we now call the cooperative group. So it's a strange kind of life cycle, but I still think that we uh, need to use that kind of analogy, at least to get us started. In my uh, book, that people-centered business book, which uh, the mad book, I'll call it in future, <laughs> um, in the second chapter, I, I do a lot of this kind of uh, preliminary uh, kind of thinking on the subject. Uh, and in that uh, uh, book, I, I had seven stages. Now, you, you may have more or, or less. You may. And I think one of the interesting things is we have such distinguished people here who have actually also used the life cycle an analogy in their own research. Maybe by the end of the conference, we could get some kind of research note together you know, to, to guide uh, young researchers in, in, uh, in the use of this analogy. There's a founding stage. There's a growth stage. By consolidation, I mean the stage at which cooperatives in a particular sector stop growing. Perhaps they start, they're still acquiring other businesses, but they, they, their geographical spread has kind of uh, fixed. Um, and um, uh, they, uh, uh, they're starting to see themselves uh, as something um, well, in a sense, they're starting to take themselves for granted, and, and that's 
one of the problems of the consolidation stage. Period of decline or uh, and disappearance or demutualization um, or a period of renewal. A strange kind of life cycle in which the, the frog uh, either dies or decides to become a, a toad. <laughs> you know? Sorry, did I say toad? A demutualized cooperative becomes a toad. That's quite nice, I think. Yeah. Um, and um, certainly the building societies that, that were demutualized in the 1990s and have now all gone bankrupt <laughs> um, w uh, had a strange kind of uh, um, life after death uh, being taken over by banks. Uh, and then hopefully, for many of us, a period of renewal. I'm pleased to say that we've just come through a period with the very painful period in the life cycle of the cooperative group in the UK, big consumer cooperatives. It's the third, third biggest consumer cooperative in the world. And uh, we have, we nearly um, uh, experienced the disappearance of the entire cooperative society. But I'm happy to say that there is a period now of renewal. Not necessarily the kind of renewal that we would have wanted, but you know, it's it's uh, uh, it's at least still alive. <laughs> now I want to ask a question about where we begin in researching into the life cycle of cooperatives. Do we begin with the individual cooperative? I think we do. If it's a new cooperative, or it's a very big one, or if it's been widely copied by other cooperatives. We might also skip that level and go straight to the level of the cooperative group. If you're looking at cooperative banks, for instance, you would want to look at the group uh, probably before you look at the individual cooperative. Um, then the cooperative sector, sometimes it's the same as the cooperative group, sometimes it's bigger and more diverse. And if you're writing a history of, of, of the cooperatives in any particular country, uh, I think this is probably the place that you would start. And then there's another level still where you look at the sector, but you compare it with, your, with its competitors. Uh, for me, this is the most interesting place to begin, if you have the statistics, because it helps us immediately to say, how are the cooperatives doing in comparison uh, with other types of business in the same uh, industry. Um, I did a bit of this, uh, well, actually, I, I, uh, with the help of Hans Grunewald's work, um, I, I did a comparison of, of uh, uh, the cooperative banks in Europe after the banking crisis of 2008, comparing them with uh, savings banks on the one hand, and um, uh, uh, capitalist banks, investor-owned banks, on the other hand. And I'm pleased to say that on every variable that you can possibly be interested in, the cooperative banks came out best, even against the savings banks, which are non-profits. So that kind of research is, I, I would highly recommend, provided you have the statistics. And then there's another level which we tend to neglect and which I want to highlight because I think it's really important. It's the, it's the biggest level, the highest level you can work at. It's the industry which the cooperatives are part of. If there are major changes that are occurring that affect all organizational types, then we need to know this before we ask the question, why did these cooperatives die? For instance, if you were looking at cotton co-ops in Tanzania in the 1990s, you might say, oh, oh, well, they mustn't have been very good because they all died out. Actually, the cotton industry died out. I think there was some kind of inf uh, infection in the, co in, the, in the cotton, something like that. And it's really important to know that it was not necessarily the fault of the cooperatives or of the cooperative form of business. You know, it was that the industry changed radically. Another example being the way the uh, banking industry is changing now. Um, and we need to know about that in order to be able to evaluate the position of cooperatives uh, within that industry. So those are the five levels. Uh, and it's useful to know which one that you're starting with and why. I also <clears throat> want to say that the three types of question uh, that we might answer, well, that we might ask about cooperatives <clears throat> 
the how, the why, and the what questions, I call them. How have cooperatives evolved and been redesigned over time? For that, we, we do history. We do economic and social history in the main. Um, that's really important because we need to know the facts, in a way, we, and we need people to interpret them, and we need people to tell a good story before we can do anything else. And the neglect of cooperative history is something that I've always felt quite keenly and tried to do something about my, in my own research. Then there's the why question. Why have cooperatives gone to particular developmental stages? You see what I mean? Question one is a prior question. Until you've answered that one, question two cannot really be um, even understood, let alone um, answered. And, but for that, the why question, um, <clears throat> we use the explanatory theories of social scientists from a variety of disciplines. And I'm pleased to say that compared with when I started researching cooperatives about 30 years ago, the young scholars here have a great advantage. The kind of disciplines that we used to use were not fit for studying cooperatives. So we did our best with what we had. It's a bit like being asked to do a job and, and being handed a toolkit, you know. And in the toolkit, there's a very large hammer called sociology, you know. And there was, there's a blunt chisel called business studies, you know. We didn't have the tools. Now you've got, oh, I'm so jealous. You have evolutionary economics, evolutionary psychology. You have behavioral psychology, you know. You, you have the whole field, or sh I should say the whole discipline of social economics in which cooperative studies can actually be situated without our having to defend our right to be there. And that is a significant uh, change for which I'm very, very grateful. The third question is the question about what is the wider significance of cooperatives. And here we're looking at what uh, European um, <coughs> academics call social philosophy. Um, something that the people in the Latin countries are actually much better at than in the Anglo-Saxon countries, where we tend to do political philosophy, which is very harsh on cooperatives. The uh, point I want to make about this, and I think it's a really important point, again, particularly for the young researchers, is do not mix up question two and question three. Keep them separate. Because we, we all mix them up in practice. We all have emotions which refuse to be separated <laughs> into the why and the what questions. But as researchers, we have to say, why has this happened? And then only when we know that can we say, and what is its significance? If, a, if the cooperative group, for instance, had gone out of business two years ago, we'd have been deeply depressed, uh, and we would have known uh, that we'd lost a huge opportunity to uh, maintain and renew uh, a, a large slice of the, the social economy. But before we go to that question, we, sh we needed to say, why did this happen? And, and in order to answer that question, we have to be very objective. Do you see what I mean? And we have to stop apologizing for cooperatives, and or when, I, when I say apologizing, arguing for cooperatives. We have to shove the, the arguments about meaning uh, uh, and about value to one side and say, let's be scientific about this. Then we bring the value questions back in. So that's what I wanted to say um, about uh, the conference theme. Um, we can draw now on some significant theories of cooperative development, Hirschman's theory of voice, Hansman's theory of ownership. Tushar Shah, an Indian economist who you may not even have heard of, and, and I, who I think has been unjustly neglected in cooperative studies, has a theory of cooperative di design and evolution, which I have used ever since I discovered it. It was published in two books in 1996, and I really recommend uh, his work. There are other theories which are being developed by people like Carlo Bazarga, for instance, Amano Tortilla, um, and, um, uh, and several other people. So our toolbox 
is actually much more refined and much more fit for purpose. Now, I'll move on quickly just to point out that the theories um, which help us to understand cooperatives <coughs> all give a very important place to governance. It seems to me that, that if you're talking about the, uh, the developmental stages of cooperatives and about understanding the dynamics uh, behind that, you probably need to start uh, not with management, but with governance. Because all of these theories <coughs> include governance right at their center. So I want to theorize the stages, and I'll do this very quickly because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm falling behind. If you're looking at the founding period of a cooperative, what are you looking for? You're looking for needs arising from market failure. You're looking for promoters to reduce what uh, the political scientists call collective action costs of starting up. People are prepared to put in a lot of time for free. You're looking for the overcoming of impediments in the institutional environment. You're looking, on social, looking for social capital on which the members can draw. And you're looking for new cooperatives to copy ones that are already successful and have established their fitness through evolution. And then you have to integrate all of that, <laughs> which is why cooperative studies is so difficult to do, because you have to do all of that. Again, with the periods of growth consolidation, I'll go through this quickly so that you can see it later. Different, you have to do different things in relation to the different periods. Um, and you can see all of these things in, in, in my work and that of several other people here. At the renewal stage, you're looking for the emergence of new leaders and supporters. New, a new sense of the comparative advantages of cooperatives, a re renewed offer to members, and governance redesign. Governance comes in again as being absolutely central to this particular period. So, and I want to uh, say something about how you link the study of governance with the stages in cooperative development. I'll explain the cake in a minute. There are three elements to good governance. Well, actually, sometimes I say four, which is annoying for you. <laughs> Don't be put off. I, I think I know what I'm doing. I sometimes bring in management as a fourth element. Sometimes I think, let's just keep management out of it for the moment. Member voice, representation, and expertise. You need all three of these. They're all uh, parts of the cake, slices of the cake. This is in the cooperative groups redesign. You could say this is member involvement, <laughs> a very small slice of the cake. Um, we shouldn't mix them up. The analogy is slicing the cake into pieces, but it's not about mixing them in a bowl. And that's really important. And it's the relative size of these three um, parts, uh, three elements of governance, um, that determines the, uh, the way the cooperative will develop in its next stage. You tend to find that in the founding stage, you cut a big piece of the cake for member involvement. At the growth stage, you, uh, you start to cut a bigger piece for um, expertise. And when, it, the, when the cooperative becomes consolidated and starts to have oligarchic tendencies, representatives steal the biggest slice of the cake. And then, if the cooperative is going down and it's declining and, and dying, representation, representatives take everything. You have boards who are self-perpetuating, inward-looking, you know, don't know, really know uh, uh, the trouble that they're in uh, and, and who eventually uh, run the cooperative into the ground. But at renewal stage, how do you cut the cake? Do you have a small slice for member involvement, big slice for representation, do you ignore expertise, like the cooperative group did until two years ago when it all fell apart? Do you put too much expertise in, like some of the mutual insurance companies, which have self-perpetuating boards of independent uh, uh, non-executives? You see, this is the field that we're looking at now. 
And uh, at Cooperatives UK, um, Ed Mayo and his team did this kind of uh, sketch, which I think is very interesting. The old cooperative group, lots of representation, very little expertise. The new cooperative group, lots of expertise, not much representation, you know, and uh, it's a nice graphic. So finally, my uh, third part of my talk, I want to link up um, what I've said about the development of cooperatives and about the importance of governance within that development to my research on, to, on the governance of very large cooperatives that have become in many cases transnational or multinational in the sense that they have members in each country and representation from each country, which is, which is in fact a crucial distinction. Um, this, by the way, is the headquarters of the cooperative group, which we were so proud of until they announced a two and a half billion pound uh, debt. Uh, I won't go on about that. The research project was prompted by this meltdown in the cooperative group and in the bank, which, which caused part, was part of the, partly the cause of the meltdown in the group. And my research was urgently, uh, it was designed urgently to find out um, if there was a general problem of governance in very large co complex cooperatives. Some people would say you, you simply can't have very large complex cooperatives. Um, and we set out to find out if that's true. And I'm pleased to say that superficially at any rate, I found that 59 of the 60 cooperatives that I was studying, 60 biggest in the world, had reasonably sound governance structures and processes in place. We can argue about the, their quality, but they were not melting down in the way that the cooperative group was. So we, um, we were cheered up by that at a very bad time for us. <laughs> the methodology goes like this. I started with um, the World Cooperative Monitor. Now, you must, if you're doing cooperative research now, look at the World Cooperative Monitor. Uh, I, I know um, uh, Euxi is struggling to, you know, to keep it going and, and, uh, and to keep it up to date and accurate and so on, but we really, really need the World Cooperative Monitor. Because without it, I could not even have identified the biggest cooperatives in the world. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's worth saying that again. I could not have identified the biggest cooperatives. <laughs> uh, it's that important that we have this kind of database. Um, I looked at six industry sectors, 10 co-ops in each sector. And I got a lot of information from the internet, websites, annual reports, so on. And then I emailed people. And as you know, you get varying uh, replies, some people don't reply, some people give you a lot of help. It's very interesting. And, I, uh, and then you start hypothesizing about why it is that certain types of co-op never answer your emails, <laughs> which is quite dangerous because it's very unscientific. Um, governance failures. Started by saying, well, how many governance failures have there been in large cooperatives? And I, I found individual failures on the producer cooperative side. Um, Murray Fulton, by the way, has done a really, really important study of uh, the failure of the Saskatchewan wheat pool. And the, the uh, uh, Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society has done a, a, a study of dairy farmers of Great Britain. It's important that we study failures. But the interesting thing is, in, I may be wrong, but I think that in producer co-ops, you have individual failures. In consumer co-ops, you have whole systems that fail whole cooperative sectors that in the 1970s and 80s went out of business. And the reason they went out of business was partly to do with the fact that they had lost touch with their members, their governance was self-serving, they had no expertise to, th to speak of, and they paid the price. Now, have I a few minutes more? Thanks. I'll just highlight some of the findings from my study, and of course you can read this uh, and subsequent pieces that I did on the, specifically on the cooperative group, and also um, a piece that I did in a, a, a th what I think is a very useful publication 
uh, on governance. It's the ICA's uh, governance think piece. I can't remember the title of it, but it, it's, it, it, that's very much worth uh, reading. There's such variety in governance structures that I was unable to classify uh, types of governance. Th this is, um, for, a, for an academic researcher, this is a kind of um, a nightmare. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I need to classify these things. We classify things in our sleep. You know, it's what we do. But there is so much variety here that I could not classify them, even by simple classifications such as a single-tier system or a two-tier system of boards. It just was not that simple. So there's no single blueprint for good governance. Corporatives have evolved structures that they've borrowed from other people and then adapted over time. And that explains partly why there is so much variety. I found that around half of them have independent expert directors on the board and more are considering it. This is a trend. Um, and whether we like it or not, this trend, I think, will continue. These b businesses are so big and so complex that they do need some people on the board with that kind of expertise. Some other pharma co-ops, I mean, some of the biggest pharma co-ops in America are resisting this. But then you see the farmers who are on their boards are already experts in what they do. So you see there are two sides to this uh, debate. Um, and I think CHS, for instance, uh, is quite right to say, we've just got farmers on our board. You know, why would we need any other kind of expertise? On the other hand, Lander Lakes now has two uh, independents on the board. So you know, you have to look at both sides. Some have intermediate regional structures. I like regions, don't you? I mean, I like, I like complexity and I like uh, uh, distributed uh, authority, you know, so that you have strong regions in which members can be more active. Um, but there are some very, very large cooperatives, but, well, particularly mutual insurance uh, uh, companies. Uh, and one credit union that I studied, that have a board, 12 members, and nothing, nothing else. I mean, that's it. <laughs> that's your governance structure. Uh, Navy Federal Credit Union, biggest credit union in the world. Well, what's your governance structure? Well, we have a board, <clears throat> and the board's elected by the, the members. Oh, right. So, uh, yeah, carry on. Well, that's it. <laughs> that's it, and it works. I don't know if it works. I assume it works. I have no evidence to say that it doesn't work. But obviously, those that have intermediate structures and find ways of involving members as representatives uh, get my vote. The distinction between unitary and two-tier boards is, is unclear. And the important thing there is uh, that you need to identify who's supervising whom whether it's a single board or a two-tier board or a board with a member council like you've got in the cooperative group now, who is supervising? Who is on the nominations committee? And who is signing the annual accounts? That's what you look for. And you find that in cooperatives, the answer to that is, is always slightly different. Uh, and the more it tends towards expertise, the more alarmed I get, and the more that aspect tends to, is given to representatives, the happier I am about it. Um, more findings, very quickly. I was very pleased to find that some of the large cooperatives are reviewing their governance structures, and they're keeping pace with changes in the membership. Land Lakes, for instance, will constantly be changing its representational structure based on the number of members and the amount of business that they do with the cooperative in each region. I mean, this is, I think, a very good idea. Um, some of them are actually trying to measure the quality of governance. They're giving parts of the business um, uh, credits or stars or whatever, you know, some, uh, something that signifies quality. And I think that is something that we're going to have to uh, try to emphasize m much more. 
Some, on the other hand, are content to keep long-standing arrangements, which are extremely unrepresentative. There's another study uh, to be done here, and I really hope somebody does this, the, 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 the place of women uh, and uh, minorities uh, on the boards of some of the big agricultural cooperatives. Not in Europe. Europe is, I think, generally good. Uh, the United States, I have to say, uh, in, in some cooperatives, mentioning no names, the, the, the lack of representativeness for anything other than middle-aged white farmers, <laughs> male farmers, is astonishing. So that seems to me an issue that we need, the ICA needs to address, you know, continue to press about. So that's it. Finally, here's my prescription. I'm, I'm going from uh, question two on my list of three questions now to question three. What would I like to see? Well, my, uh, my theory of governance goes like this. The board has to find out what the members and potential members need. That's the starting point. It has to govern in such a way that these needs are made central to the purpose of the cooperative. It has to control managers so that they keep member centrality in their business operations. And it has to keep in touch with members to find out how their needs and aspirations are changing. And it constantly, it has to make sure that its own representativeness uh, is, um, is acceptable to the members and also to wi the wider society. Three elements, four elements, I'm not decided. Member involvement, representation, expertise. Don't mix them up. Design them into your cooperative very carefully so that they work together uh, and so that one isn't dominant. Uh, and then hope that you hire very good, honest managers and then sit back and see what happens. <laughs> right. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, we have some time. So we are going to have, as I mentioned, these elevator speeches, a very American concept. Huh? Um, but before that, perhaps we can have a few questions, yeah? So um, you can probably keep this on. Sorry, sorry, you have that, yeah. Okay, does anybody have any questions? that they'd like, or comments, that they'd like to have on this presentation. We've heard about life cycles. We've got many life cycle experts here. We've heard about governance. We have very many governance experts here. I don't know if we have cake experts. But one thing I noticed was, um, from a, I'm, I'm in the faculty of, of management, and I thought, well, yeah, management is pretty important, I think, yeah. All those things. Thing. The linkages between management and governance, of course, it, that's another big subject, and it's really important. And it is often what goes wrong, you know, isn't it? That, that your governance structure might be quite good on paper, but if the manager is arrogant and knows everything and you know nothing, <laughs> you know, uh, as a board, then, you know, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the crowd? Or are we going to be shy? Okay. Uh, Silvia Sacchetti, Open University, and uh, Eurix. Thank you very much, uh, Johnson, for this uh, opening lecture. Um, I have a question coming off uh, of my research experience in uh, smaller cooperatives with mm. respect to this you're analyzing, um, and particularly social cooperatives. Um, uh, what I have observed is that uh, although these are, they, in, in Italy at least, they tend to be worker cooperatives, mm. their aim is actually to fulfill uh, the um, user's welfare. So basically, uh, sometimes users are part of the members. Uh, but 
there isn't exactly an overlap between the nature of uh, traditional cooperatives. He has that uh, you know aim of fulfilling members' uh, welfare yes. mostly, and the. The, the nature of the social cooperative that mm. has this very strong user focus. Right. Mm. Um, <coughs> so there's, a, there, there's somehow, you know, like it adds probably something else to this um, uh, typology and diversity of, uh, of, of species. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, you're quite right. I, I, I my uh, uh, views on uh, multi-stakeholder cooperatives are what you might call under-theorized. <laughs> I'm, I'm not good at theorizing multi-stakeholding because I start from a very strong member-centric uh, view of, of, of a cooperative. And I think it would be very interesting if, if other people such as yourself were to, uh, were to take my uh, kind of theoretical framework and to say, well, you know, can we expand it? Can we change it? You know, can it in, uh, be become more inclusive? Um, and if not, then I suppose my theoretical framework would have to be restricted to cooperatives that have one strong type of member. I don't know the answer to that, but I'd, I'd love it to find out. <laughs> Um, thank you, Janssen. It's if at Solel. Um, I, I thank you for your presentation. I think, um, well, I'm a great believer in members' involvement, but in big cooperatives, in con consumers' cooperatives, definitely in cooperative banks or mm. mutuals, and even in, well, smaller consumers' cooperatives, most members don't want to be really involved and there's always very small percentage of the members who are willing to be involved. So, I mean, how can we combine between these, the, the, the theory and the great need and uh, desire to have members involved and how to practice it? Well, the first thing I have to say is it doesn't really matter if only a small percentage of, of the members are involved. Uh, there was a study done, we'd, we had a, an overhaul of mutual insurance uh, uh, governance in, in Britain a few years ago, 10 years ago. And for that, we, we commissioned some research and it, it said something like, uh, I don't know, I mean, imagine, you know, the big insurance mutual and it has two million uh, policyholder members uh, and, uh, you know, 6% say, yeah, we'd love to be involved. Well, that's a lot of people. And it's a very, uh, you know, as long as it's a representative uh, group of people uh, or, or you can create a representative group out of it, it's fine. And in, in, I'm, I'm, I've been impressed by the way in which consumer cooperatives, big ones like uh, Migro and uh, uh, Coop Swiss, um, SOK in particular in, in, in Finland, have, have uh, found uh, mechanisms for involving members um, at the regional level uh, or, or, or in health cooperatives, for instance, at the level of, of, of type of member so that you get uh, older people in some of the health co-ops in America um, who, who join a, a, a group who are specifically charged with representing um, older uh, members of, of the health co-op. So, um, and then, so there's lots of Lots of rich kind of complex ways in which you can involve people. But the other thing that, tell you the thing that really impressed me, there are two Japanese mutual insurance societies, you know, and a lot of people would say, actually, they're not, not really co-ops because although they're, they've got members, you know, what they're, they're a self-perpetuating board. They're like uh, a lot of the mutuals, their boards say, we have two places, we want Smith and Jones, <laughs> and we want you to vote for Smith and Jones, or not vote for Smith and Jones. I mean, that's the that's the you know that's the uh, uh, extent of democracy. But in these two Japanese mutuals, they went out and they had a road show, and you know they filled rooms uh, with with uh, their policyholders, and they went out night after night after night, and. 
they actually engaged with about 20,000 people every year you know, to find out what their members thought. And I thought that was staggeringly good. It, it's, so, it's such hard work. But, you know, if you want, if you want to, uh, there are plenty of ways of, of uh, uh, making up for this deficit in member involvement. But the main thing is that the organization should be member-centered to start with. You're, uh, and if, as, as some of the consumer cooperatives are doing, if your focus switches so that you're no longer interested in members, you're only interested in the community, as Migro tends to do, or in customers, as Coop Suisse, Suisse tends to do, cooperative groups still having this debate, but you know, who are we for? If you are for shoppers or the community, then you probably should stop being a co-op and you should become a, a non-profit and have trustees. Thank you, uh, Johnston, uh, for the presentation. Uh, my question is, mm, I think you focus, um, is about the, the, the mix of the four elements. You, know? mm. you, you stress the, the different mixes in different uh, uh, stage of the life cycle of the cooperative. I think but so. My mm. feeling is that, or I, 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 would, I would ask, uh, did you find also differences uh, you already answered a little bit, but uh, um, uh, uh, differences among cooperatives, uh, uh, different types of cooperatives. Because my, my feeling is that empowerment, for instance, it, mm. uh, the empowerment depends a lot on the, uh, on, on the importance that the cooperative has in the, in the, in the economy of the, of the members. Ah, uh, yes. In yes. case of, of, uh, of uh, agricultural cooperatives, for instance, also large cooperatives have mm tend to have a high involvement of the members. Mm. Instead, consumer cooperatives, mm. which cover only a, a, a little part of the, of the economy of the members, mm. Mm, they don't need to have such a, and, and, good go, and good management is much mm. more important than involvement. Yes. And yes. Man, many failures of, uh, of consumer cooperatives depend, uh, depend that, that were, 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 were due to, to, the, to the, um, the, the bad management, so managers were not, not because it's impossible for, for members to, to, to control. Yes. The, 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 the. And also members are not interested in controlling because they have also other, other chances. For instance, consumer cooperatives, if the cooperative fail, they can refer oh, yes. to another, to another yes. shop. Yes, yes, I think all that's, that's true. And, and uh, more and more, I'm distinguishing between producer cooperatives and consumer cooperatives. Uh, and uh, I'm struggling to keep the two together as uh, being the same animal you know because because they may be so different that uh, the motivations may be so different that we need to treat them separately on the other hand um you can have get member involvement in consumer cooperatives at the local and regional levels you can get involvement on questions of value to do with fair trade and to do with uh, local economies uh and um the the, the, other way, the other way of looking at the bad management situation is that bad managers were able to get away with basically acquiring too many other businesses and then losing a lot of money. The Cooperative Bank did this with, with the Britannia Building Society. The Cooperative Group did it with Summerfield. The members were never asked. Now, if you have a governance structure in which uh, uh, the members are... are, are uh, required to vote on these things and given independent sources of information, which is not difficult. You, you know, you, you could you could uh, design that into your governance structure in a weekend, really. Then um, the members form uh, a barrier against uh, bad management, and they they stop. <clears throat> they may stop the cooperative from growing quickly, but they they keep it uh, sound, um, and. Uh, without that, the consumer cooperative is in, always in danger from, from uh, managers who just want to buy things. <coughs> right.
Oh, right. Right. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Johnston, for a, a very stimulating presentation um, and thought-provoking. Um, Thank you. My question is about uh, your life cycle model. And it seems to me that uh, in, in between consolidation and, several, and the other options, mm. uh, particularly one, the one about demutualization, there's, there's a sort of, the, there might be space for another box to do with hybridity, hybrid forms, which, ah, yes. which, which are you know, some way towards demutualization. Right. But, but are, the, there's, there's difficult questions about it, whether it's still a cooperative or not, but it's, it's certainly moving in the di direction of um, a, a for-profit structure. Um, and yeah. I, 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 yeah. I think that, that those categories are, are probably quite interesting ones of, of hybrids in, in lots of different ways, particularly, say, in the agricultural sector. Thank you. That's great. I mean, I knew that, that, that you know, when, you, when you're in a place like this, you, you present something and you know that somebody's going to make it better. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> it's very exciting. Uh, right. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, that was great. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just up there. <laughs> um, I, I like your presentation very much because I think it gave us a real framework for the rest of the conference here. And I know there's lots of questions, and that's, there should be, and that's great. We have three days. We can work through those questions. Now I'd like to invite to the, to the table um, Linda Shaw, Carla Wurzaga, and the Ampola. There's a steps here. You don't have to jump up. But <laughs> I prefer the steps. <laughs> Linda. So the idea here was just to have three people who are very different, who have different areas of research and who have different perspectives to throw out uh, a quick elevator speech of what they think are the most important areas of cooperative research in the next five years from their perspective. And sort of throw this out, and particularly for young researchers, to, to get a nice panorama of, of what there is, okay? Linda Shaw is a cooperative educator. She's from the, the Cooperative College. I've had the pleasure of working on her uh, projects with her while she was still there. And now I, I you look very relaxed, so I assume <laughs> it's been a nice year. Um, Professor Carla Wurzaga is, a, is president of Urixi which is uh, a research center that I'm particularly grateful to because they've given us a lot of support for this and, and they also housed me for three months many, many years ago, which is lovely. And Professor Diane Poehler, who, Dion Poehler, who came all the way from Saskatchewan, wow, to be with us. And um, you're in a business school, you're in the center of cooperative study, the center for the study of cooperatives in Saskatchewan, and you hold three different positions. So I think you probably have a really good perspective on the areas of research that can be possible. Okay, so without further ado, Linda, maybe you'd like to start. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation and it's, it's very good to, to be here and see some familiar faces and hopefully make some new contacts and colleagues. I was asked recently at the Cooperative College Research Conference to do a, an overview, a reflection of last 10 to 15 years I've spent in cooperative research. And I just would say that I very much concur with Johnston Birchall that the, the scene has got a lot more positive. I think there are certainly more academic and disciplinary tools available. There are more spaces for us, if you like, as cooperative researchers. And I, I, my sense is that that will continue, that we will see that nesting in, if you like, of cooperative research in different disciplines, in different universities, in different schools. And it's been very clear to us, certainly in the UK, and I think in uh, uh, Europe, a uh, lesser extent in Africa, that the growth of uh, interesting cooperatives amongst young scholars 
and I'm very pleased to have the Young Scholars Network emerging, researchers network, I think that's very, very positive. But I do think the challenge, and this may be just a UK experience, but I think I suspect wider, is the challenge in the next five to 10 years is how do we ensure that the, the young scholars that are researching cooperatives, you know, completing their doctoral studies, can then move on to positions within the academy, within universities, or indeed within the cooperative movement, because I don't think we all have to see a very narrow academic track. How can we enable their participation both in continuing research and the movement. We do have a problem in the UK that we have some very able young or early career researchers, but you know there is a lack of posts and positions for them. And I think there's something that we need to look at as a movement and so on, is to make sure that this interest in cooperative research and cooperatives amongst younger researchers is able to be translated into real and productive careers within longer-term careers in cooperative research. Um, a couple of other points, that, the pitches that I, I, I would make. Certainly, governance and education are key themes here, and I'm pleased to see the way education is re-emerging as a research onto the research agenda for cooperatives, and I very much second that, and would like to see a lot more studies into education and training what's worked best, what are the institutional histories, how can we take that understanding forward to shape our own research and education and training. And that's been particularly the UK Cooperative College role in terms of being a reflective set, reflective practitioners around cooperative education. And we have triggered, uh, been partly responsible for triggering you know, the growth of cooperative schools in the UK, um, as a new education model for cooperatives. So also the notion of conversion. Uh, Johnson, you've spoken about found, uh, you know, founding cooperatives. Let's put that conversion element in. We are seeing uh, public sector conversions to mutuals and cooperatives. How does that shape their development? You're not starting with a blank sheet, you're starting with an existing organisation. So how, how does that shape cooperative development and sustainability? I would very much like to see more data on gender, for example, because I know the work I've done and colleagues at the ICA has been very much hampered by the lack of data on gender, which is not collected, gender and leadership in particular, which is not collected by our cooperatives. So again, uh, 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 we could do a lot more around gender, but we need the database to do that. A um, couple more very brief points. Um, since I've semi-retired, I've dipped my toes back into the corporate world, which is where I partly worked before on labour issues, and particularly around supply chain ethics, about labour standards in supply chains, and in the UK we have a new act called Modern Slavery, which is around corporates making sure that there are there, are not, there is not modern slavery happening in their international supply chains. This is hugely challenging. But what it struck me was that cooperatives often say, we are ethical businesses, we stand on our ethics. But let's see more evidence of how that actually works. Does it work in practice? How do cooperative supply chains work? Are they any different to corporates? I suspect probably not in many cases, but let's look at how those ethics are that social responsibilities being put into practice because I've seen a lot of very interesting work done by mainstream corporates that actually I think co-ops are lagging behind in and I suspect there's an area there again for reflective practice. Um, and finally um, we were asked a question by a colleague at the Open University which was why don't pe why do some people ref refuse to join co-ops, especially in Africa? We found that a very problematic area to, to look at. So I think the reasons why people don't join are also important related to community. And finally, to say in terms of international development, um, I'm happy to report that Cooptives Europe and Cooptive development agencies in Europe have reached a framework agreement with the European Commission, which now recognises cooperatives as development actors. This is a five-year agreement with the ICA designed to raise the capacity of uh, cooperatives in the developing world and the ICA offices and to do some research. So we're very much looking forward to that launch and uh, Ariel 
is here from Co-ops Europe as the new research officer. So if you're interested in cooperatives in the developing world, do talk to us, myself or Ariel, because we're just at the start of a new uh, five-year agreement which has a strong research component in it. It's my tour? Yeah? Okay. Five uh, minutes for four, five issues for five minutes. But I would like to, 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 uh, to begin with a, a, a comment on the first uh, um, point uh, made by, by Linda about the, the availability of funds for, for financing researchers. My, my, my feeling is that, as also looking at the experience I had with, with the BRICS and uh, in, in, in the last 30 years uh, in my activities with, uh, with the cooperative movement. I think that what, what the, 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 the first step is to convince the cooperative movement that there is a community of researchers which uh, 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 have developed a lot of, um, of, of ideas about, about, the, the, about cooperative that can help the development of cooperative and then and this means that the, the, to convince the cooperative movement at, at the international level, national international level, that uh, uh, they have to, to use better their resources to finance this, uh, this uh, research community. Because when I, when I, I see the, the Quebec summit and, I, and, and uh, looking at the program, I, I, I notice that there are a lot of reports made by Deloitte, Accenture, Accenture, Mac McKinsey. And I read some of them. I really don't understand why cooperative are, what, what, what cooperative think about research, because these are not organizations able to, they have, no, they have no knowledge about what a cooperative is. Eh? And, uh, and what, what is strange is when, when I was invited to discuss one of these reports, all the panel uh, uh, was against the finding of the report, but at, in, the, in, the final, uh, in, the, in the final document of the, of the summit, there was exactly the same, the, the, the same uh, um, sentences that were already in the, in the, in the report. So mm, this is the problem. There is a community which is not recognized by the cooperative movement. Cooperative movement spent a lot of money in researches, but with a very poor results. This is the first point. It's not the point, it's, it's, it's a, for, a first comment. Uh, about the research issues, I, I think that in the future we have, or, or in my view, we, we have to, to stress f many f four, four issues. The, f the first one is uh, we need to improve the knowledge of the statistics about the, economics and social, the economic size and the econ and social impact of cooperative. Without uh, good uh, uh, statistics, we cannot say anything about the importance of cooperative, or you, 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 have, you, you cannot say enough about the importance of cooperative. We cannot continue to say that cooperatives in the world have one billion for, of, of members and uh, five millions of employees. It's not true, we don't know exactly what is going on, and so we need to improve. I, I, I simply remember that one person, Solomon, uh, uh, Esther, uh, Lester Salomon, was able to convince the United, ma many countries, many, uh, ma many statistical offices, and the UN statistical office to develop a larger research and a methodology to, uh, to, to, uh, um, to uh, account for the non-profit sector. The cooperative movement is much larger than the non-profit sector, but it was not able to, 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 to have the same result. Second, we need, I think, to improve the theory of cooperative and uh, the, the interpretation of uh, the, the economic and social role of cooperative. But moving in, in, in new direction, one is uh, already, what was already uh, mentioned by, by, by John, John Stone when he said, we have a lot of theories now, social, social economic theories, which can help a lot in, in interpreting cooperatives. We, we have the Austrian theory, for instance, about cooperation. Uh, we have the, the behavioral economics, not only the behavioral psychology, but also the behavioral economics, which is a growing field in economics. And we are not using this, this uh, we, we need to use this type of new theories to interpret cooperatives, uh, especially uh, taking into account that most of our models are already, are still based on the idea that cooperatives as an institution which use the market rules, where market is means gain from trade. This is not true. 
because all, all, all the issues about, for instance, financing or the issues about, about uh, opportunistic behavior in cooperative are, co are completely wrong because they are taken from, from, from a theory which, which is not the, the theory of uh, use, useful for, for, uh, for interpreting cooperatives. And secondly, we, 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 we have to start to give more, more attention to the differences among cooperatives because an agricultural cooperative is not similar to, to, to a worker cooperative. But most of, most of the issues we, we, we stressed about cooperatives, in, th about, uh, in, 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 in theories dealing with cooperatives, are still linked to the worker, to the model developed for, to interpret worker cooperatives, but they are applied to, to agricultural cooperatives. What, what does it mean that all cooperatives have, have financial problems or difficulties? This is true for worker cooperatives, but it's not true for, for consumer cooperatives. It's not true or cannot be true for agricultural cooperatives because they, they, these, are, they, these are different. They, they, are, they are different. They are, they are, we, don't, we, we cannot interpret cooperative as, as a single form. We have to, look, to, to, to work on different types of cooperatives. And third issue is uh, we need to, to, to work to interpret the merging of new cooperative and the, uh, and the consequences of, of the, these uh, new cooperatives on uh, the composition of the membership more and more, they, are plural, they have pluralistic membership. But we don't have a theory to interpret this evolution. We are still dealing with cooperative, single membership cooperatives. And what it means about governance, because to govern a multi-stakeholder cooperative is not the same to govern a, a, a mono-stakeholder cooperative. And especially, we, we, I think we have to, 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 to research about, uh, uh, about the, the new cooperative uh, providing uh, uh, collective goods, if you want, or general inter interest goods, because they are they are really developing in, in, in a situation where both in countries with, develop, with a, a welfare state and countries without a welfare state, the, the, the state is, 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 is providing less and less services. It's not able to, to, to take uh, over, uh, <coughs> to, 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 to follow the, the need. So we have to, to, test much more, to, to study much, much more this type of cooperatives. My feeling is that the lesson given by lay law in 1980, at the conference of the ICA in Moscow, which, which inspired the, 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 the Social Cooperative Italian movement, is still alive. The problem is that they, 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 there are they, they, one of the, of the reasons of the uh, crisis of the cooperative uh, was, or, or, or the, 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 the low development of cooperatives during, during the, 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 the past century was the role of the state, because the state took a lot of activities which were mainly run by cooperatives. But now the state is, is uh, withdrawing. So we need to rethink the role of cooperatives in the new. And finally, other, the very, very, very shortly, the, the other two, we need to compare much more the institutional, national institutional models, how cooperatives are ruled and how cooperatives develop their own uh, national uh, framework because and to, to see what are the mm, successful institutional elements uh, in, in each country. For instance, one point, an interesting point, there are few countries where cooperatives are, are non-profit distribution constrained, but the non-profit distribution constraint, where it, where it, it, it exists, uh, 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 contrasted any type of demutualization. Why not? The, the non-profit distribution constraint is consistent with the nature of the, of, of the cooperatives and is a very good way to avoid demutualization. Because if uh, you, you cannot distribute the value of the asset, you don't have any incentive to sell the assets. And you, you, you don't have any incentive to, to uh, uh, demutualize the cooperative. And finally, we have to improve the knowledge of cooperatives in promoting innovation, especially social innovation. Again, in contrasting the, the mainstream business sec sector approach or business uh, 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 academic approach that still think that uh, uh, innovation comes from single entrepreneurs, hero entrepreneurs, and that collective organization cannot uh, uh, develop in innovation. This is uh, exactly what is happening now with social innovation, which was started by, by, by cooperatives in many cases, and, and now in the, business, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the business studies are seen as as there is this um, growing um, growing uh, emphasis on the 
uh, Ashoka Foundation and all these kind of, of, uh, uh, of ad 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 advocators, there is this strong emphasis on the role of single entrepreneur. This is not true. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Well, what's uh, really interesting, um, I'm really grateful to be here at this conference. It's my first major cooperative conference. Um, and what I, I like about it uh, comes um, really from what Carlo has pointed out, which is I think that the problems and, and the unique challenges and the interesting areas of research that face cooperatives, we need to recognize um, are historically embedded in, in the institutional, political, economic, and social context of where the co-op sectors in the particular countries are forming. And so, um, you know, in light of that, um, some of the things that I think are the um, most interesting areas for co-op research um, are really embedded in the problems that are facing um, the cooperatives, and particularly the major and large cooperatives in, um, in Canada right now. And the Centre for the Study of Co-ops at the University of Saskatchewan under um, Dr. Brett Fairburn, who's here, um, and who many of you know, um, did a, a study in the last year on um, a, uh, surveying or, uh, co op leaders from across the country, um, board directors, managers, um, other people who have identified as being involved with the sector, to have them identify what they thought the most pressing concerns facing their cooperative organizations were today. And I'm, d I'm not going to go through all of the, the top issues they said, but I'm going to focus on the top five. And number one, interestingly enough, was cooperation among cooperatives. Um, Cooperative leaders um, feel that um, there needs to be a lot more cooperation um, between the different cooperatives within sectors, but also across sectors to develop a unified national voice and a broader vision of the cooperative economy. Um, to identify common vision and goals, and to help, um, this will help not just the large co-ops in building economies of scale and, 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 and uh, building awareness of the model, but it also works, these networks re re work to reduce the isolation of small co-ops, so that was the number one. The number two was um, competitiveness, and in this, um, respondents had very strong views on the need for especially large co-ops um, to maintain their comparative advantage in an increasingly competitive and globalized environment. Gone are the days, um, particularly in Canada, um, in, in some of the agricultural areas where co-ops were are um, geographically embedded in particular communities. They're growing, they're merging, they're consolidating, and so as a result, they're directly competing with large investor-owned firms, and this is a major challenge for them in trying to uh, sustain themselves. So so they need to um, understand how to compete in a way that's unique to co-ops and true to their values and heritage, and that's one of the biggest things they're struggling with. Um, and I think that that is also uniquely linked to governance, and there's a lot of interesting areas in terms of research around the intersection between strategy and governance. Number three was government relations, and um, our informants um, and the co-op leaders discussed um, that there is a need to articulate a public policy agenda for co-ops. Um, at the regional and federal levels in Canada, um, and that there is also a very real need to cultivate policy-specific expertise in taxation law and public policy within the sector. And I think this is in recognition that the challenges that we're facing there are a lot to do with the fact that there isn't a lot of awareness or understanding of the model among policymakers, and even now the general public, there, there is a real lack of understanding. We have a ton of co-op members in Canada and almost nobody understands the model. Um, I think for a research, from a researcher's perspective, one of the things that is important for governments is measuring impact. Um, for us to actually be able to get some of the research, um, some of our research on impact out, to try and figure out ways to actually measure co-op impact in a real way um, that can stand up against scrutiny, and, and, and especially because we're often comparing apples and oranges. Um, and so I think it's important that we try and figure out ways to do that. The fourth biggest issue um, was access to capital and financing. And this is not just, this is across sectors, it's across large and small co-ops. Large co-ops face issues um, around capital adequacy requirements in financial credit unions um, and in terms of accessing um, capital to grow um, their businesses, and, and also um, small, small uh, startup cooperatives um, face major of funding constraints. Um, unless they're getting funding from the large co-ops, uh, they're, they're often constrained in trying to get money from 
um, uh, to start up uh, new cooperatives and, and, and develop new cooperatives. And then finally, the last thing that was raised, and I touched on it a little bit in the government relations part, but was public awareness of the model. Um, so related to this is what's What's the relevance of the model? Um, how um, how uh, does co-op development address people's needs? Um, what's feasible? What, how is the model feasible given some of the constraints that that are faced from a, a legal and political and economic standpoint in developing co-ops in Canada? Um, and and also there is interestingly enough um, there is a little bit of, around um, understanding there, there's potentially uh, negative implications of a member centric approach to co-ops for communities that I think um, some people are starting to touch on um, and 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 that we really need to be um, clear about that that there are for instance, large, um, large uh, um, consumer co-ops, second-tier co-ops in, in um, Canada where members are, um, own refineries and, and there are major implications um, around, around some of that for the environment and other kinds of sustainability issues in communities. And so there are a lot of these kinds of issues that also need to be um, addressed in, in, um, um, in understanding uh, the impact of co-ops. So I think... Um, that, that comes a little bit out of um, some of my perspectives mixed in with some of the perspectives of, of co-op leaders across Canada. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. I think we, in a very short space of time, we've, we've got a lot of issues to look at. Thank you. I wish we had more time, so apologies for making this so short. Um, just a few things before we have coffee. I will have to explain a little bit the logistics here. The coffee and lunches will be, just go straight down this hall. It's on the other side. Yeah, there's a big room there. I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the book that you have in front of you, the abstract book and the program. All of the program abstracts are online. We have Wi-Fi here, and uh, the code is eight, eight times, okay? If you go into the, the program address, which is on the bottom of the program, you can see, if you click on each presentation in the sessions, you can see the abstract, and if people have uploaded their papers and presentations, you'll have them right in front of you, okay? The other point about the abstract book was we've left a lot of space at the end of the book for you to make notes, and also we expect that you can write on the abstracts as you go along. The abstracts are ordered in um, to follow the order of the presentations through the days, okay? So it should make it easy for you to go through. The thin program is the one that has the, the, the website in the bottom where you can click on the, the papers, abstracts, and PowerPoint presentations. Three of, the south, three of the rooms, the conference rooms, are actually across the street in the Barcelo Hotel. Okay, so if you have a session, you have to look and it says Barcelo, it means that it's on the other side. And then we have this room and the next room, which are the Palacio de Congresos rooms, okay? And I want to make a comment and apology for these posters that keep falling down. The idea was, is that we wanted to put up a demonstration or of the 150 nationalities that work in our cooperative sector. And this was a, a photo project done by a, a photographer. And we thought it would be nice to put up. The problem is, is that they don't seem to want to stay up in the humid weather these days. So apologies if they're falling down during their presentations. OK. So we're just a tiny bit behind, so that's not bad, considering we started late. Um, so please have coffee, and then look where you must go at the next session which should be at 11.15, okay? Fantastic.